So my name is Hassan Shapurian. I'm the second speaker of today. Uh, let me stop my video. Let's see. Okay. All right. So you can uh, everyone see my slides? At least one person from here. Okay, great. Uh, uh, so uh, today I would like to tell you about uh, uh, a work in progress on partial transpose of uh, density matrices of an anionic chain. Um, so this work uh, is in collaboration with uh, Shinsei Ryu, who is my PhD advisor, who was my PhD advisor, and uh, Roger Monk from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge uh, insightful discussions uh, so far with Ashwin Vishwanath and Max Matlitsky and Central. Okay, so let me begin with a quick summary of my talk. Uh, so I would like to answer or address the following two questions to some extent. So first is, what is the partial transpose? Uh, and by that, I don't mean just a definition uh, of the partial transpose, something which uh, may uh, shed some uh, light on the physics of the operation, the so-called partial transpose. And then also, what is the uh, uh, associated uh, entanglement measure of this quantity. So uh, I should actually apologize a little bit uh, to uh, our local participant. So you might have seen some related, uh, some of the things here uh, maybe uh, repeatedly from my previous talk uh, about a month ago, but I try to minimize the overlap. Um, so uh, the quick answer uh, as I show or as I bring, uh, as I provide some evidence today is uh, partial transpose is essentially uh, like a braiding or half a braid, as you will see. And uh, the entanglement negativity uh, actually measures the quantum dimension of the underlying degrees of freedom on the chain. Okay, so let me start with a brief introduction to uh, entanglement negativity and partial transpose. Uh, so originally it was discovered in um, context of quantum information theory that if you want to quantify the entanglement in a state which is described by a density matrix, so a uh, mixed state, uh, the von Neumann entanglement entropy or Rennie entanglement entropy uh, does uh, gives you some uh, values, uh, although your state could be, or your density matrix could be uh, classically correlated. So essentially the difficulty with density matrix is that it's a mixture of quantum and classical correlations and the usual standard pure state entanglement measures like von Neumann entropy and any entanglement entropy uh, uh, cannot identify these uh, classically pr uh, prepared states or uh, cannot uh, distinguish classical correlations from the quantum correlations. And uh, just to uh, you know, set the stage, we know that uh, density matrices are quite prevalent in uh, condensed matter systems. So let's say uh, at some level uh, you're interested in computing or measuring the, or maybe just finding whether two subsystems in a bigger system are entangled or not. So you need to trace out all the extra degrees of freedom. So essentially the state of A union B uh, in this uh, first, um, uh, first image uh, is given by a density matrix. Or let's say you want to find the entanglement uh, between two subsystems uh, where the, the entire state, uh, the entire system is in 
uh, contact with some thermal band. So again, the state of the system is given by a density matrix. So turns out partial transpose uh, uh, could help in addressing entanglement or in characterizing these states um, in terms of how much entanglement you have. Um, so uh, let me just give you a formal definition of partial transpose, which was uh, originally discovered again in a qubit system or quantum information systems in uh, 90s. Uh, so let's start with a density matrix. So density matrix can be represented in a given orthonormal basis. So here I have two subsystems, A and B. You see that ket or bra has two parts, so A and B. And then we have this bunch of coefficients. So uh, the full transpose, again, we are all familiar with, is just when you change the indices between bra and ket. So you can do it either at the level of this basis vector in the operator space, or you can just uh, switch these indices. So they are the same thing. I mean, here are these uh, indices, uh, or these, uh, these are just the uh, you know, variables that we are summing over uh, these two processes that I just described give you the same thing, either changing the indices, exchanging the pair of indices, or exchanging the bra and um, So uh, this partial transpose in, is then defined when you apply transpose only to part of a system. So let's say I'm just exchanging these, uh, uh, the basis vectors, uh, these uh, local uh, basis for the A subsystem. So as you see here. So here I have IJKL, here I have KJIL. One can do a similar thing for the coefficient, for the matrix element here, uh, when I exchange I with K. Um, so again, another way of uh, thinking about this process is when you, uh, when you write the density matrix in a block uh, matrix form, uh, then partial transpose uh, is uh, defined as applying transpose to every block. So these blocks are operators which act on let's say Hilbert space of A, so I'm only applying transpose to these. The full transpose is when I exchange, for example, this block with that block as well. Okay, so uh, now what it does is partial transpose is it changes the spectrum of the uh, density matrix. So remember, a density matrix is a positive semi-definite operator, meaning that it has uh, all uh, non-negative eigenvalues, uh, and then turned out when you apply partial transpose to an entangled de uh, density matrix, which describes an entangled state, then you'll get some negative eigenvalues. So still this process of partial transpose preserves the norm. So the uh, sum of the eigenvalues uh, add to one, but um, uh, we have these negative eigenvalues. So this was uh, you know, discovered as an indicator of having entanglement. And uh, one simple example of that is when you apply to a classical state. So this is just a uh, linear superposition of the product state with positive coefficients. Then it doesn't change the spectrum, meaning that it doesn't it give you it doesn't give you any negative eigenvalues. And we know that this is actually a perfect example of a classically correlated state, also known as a separable state. Uh, so one can uh, go further and define a measure of entanglement in terms of these negative eigenvalues. So uh, this is uh, what is called, what is known as uh, negativity or logarithmic negativity. And, uh, you know, the process kind of suggests this name negativity. So here, uh, negativity is just the sum over absolute value of the negative eigenvalues or the log negativity is the log of the one norm, which is uh, just the sum over absolute value of all the eigenvalues. Uh, so let me not get into details of the negativity and focus more on the partial transpose itself. But it has also uh, a lot of nice properties, both in context of quantum information theory and more recently in uh, holographic theories. So um, partial transpose or uh, strictly speaking entanglement negativity uh, has been used in various contexts uh, in condensed matter physics and high energy physics. So here I'm listing, um, this is just a you know, uh, partial list of uh, some more relatively recent works. And uh, uh, for today, I would like to uh, focus on this relatively recent, again, or more recent application of the 
uh, topological invariance in the context of uh, topological superconductors. Um, okay, so let me uh, just continue, but give you uh, um, uh, just one slide background information uh, uh, for this uh, topological phases protected by time reversal symmetry. So remember the standard uh, topological order, like in two plus one, uh, we can distinguish them at least, you know, loosely speaking in terms of the ground state degeneracy when we put them on higher genus manifolds. So uh, there is no symmetry here uh, um, in our uh, system. Uh, what we can just play with is just increase the, uh, you know, number of holes or handles or the genus of the manifold. And as a result, we see that the ground state uh, degeneracy changes. So it depends on the, uh, um, the genus number. So in some sense, uh, the topological order responds to uh, this number of holes. Um, then um, an analog of this uh, handle for time reversal symmetric systems is something called the cross cap. Uh, so note that uh, here it's a loose analogy, but uh, I'm talking about now one plus one D theories, like this Kitai of Myrana chain that uh, we heard about in the previous talk. And it turned out when you twist the space-time boundary conditions by the time reversal, uh, you, you'll get uh, non-orientable manifolds. And this cross cap is just a generator of the non-orientable manifold, two, uh, one plus one uh, non-orientable space-time manifolds. Um, so then here cross cap plays the same role as these holes in the previous context. Okay, so uh, now, uh, now that we uh, have this uh, interesting information, uh, what we asked uh, uh, you know, some time ago was uh, uh, whether one can write a quantity in terms of the ground state wave function, which measures this partition function, which computes this partition function. Some sort of a framework you can think of where the um, ground state, uh, um, wave function is given as an input and then this framework or this quantity spits out the topological number. Let's say if I have this topological superconductors that Matt described in the presence of time reversal symmetry where the classification is Z8, uh, there are only eight possible states. So this new gives you uh, the topological index which is some number between zero and seven. Uh, so turns out uh, the answer is this quantity written here. So it is related to partial transpose, okay? So uh, it's kind of detail uh, and let me not bore you with the, uh, with, you know, technical um, details of uh, the derivation. Um, uh, but uh, what I want to, uh, um, you know, carry over is, uh, uh, is that uh, when you compute this quantity trace of row, row partial transpose, um, on a 1D chain, when you have the reduced density matrix of two, uh, intervals next to each other, it gives you a real projective plane. And if uh, you have this density matrix describing the state of two intervals, which are separate from each other, what we call a disjoint interval, it gives you a Klein buckle. And uh, these unitaries are just a unitary part of the time reversal. It's not that important for our discussion at the moment. Um, so, uh, let me give you an, an immediate example, as I mentioned. So take this Kitai of Majorana chain in the presence of time reversal symmetry where T squared is one. So if you just go ahead and compute this quantity, remember uh, um, uh, Matt's Hamiltonian that we have a chemical potential, just take the mean field Hamiltonian for the moment. And uh, I'm computing this trace of row row partial transpose as a function of mu. So we go from a trivial phase to a topological phase and uh, the phase of this quantity uh, changes from zero to one if I compute it for these adjacent intervals, which, which corresponds to the partition function on RP2. So one interesting thing that I can add at this point is I already tried it, uh, tried computing this quantity for particle number conserving um, superconductors. And uh, interesting enough, uh, it, it does give you this uh, topological invariant. So, uh, it seems like this quantity um, is a many-body uh, topological invariant, and it also works for uh, particle number conserving systems, just as a side remark. Uh, all right, so um, turns uh, out I, that- Sorry, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? 
Uh, hello? Sure. Yeah, yes. so, so, so in the previous uh, practice, actually, uh, the wave function or the density matrix you use for the KTF chain, is that a many body ground state or is the free form and you know, ground state? Uh, yeah, so the input right now, I, uh, so th this plot in particular, uh, you know, I use the Gaussian property of the Slater determinant to rewrite this uh, in term. So this row is a many body density matrix, but uh, it's a Gaussian operator for free fermions. And I can use the Gaussian property to do this calculation for, let's say, arbitrarily large system size. But uh, uh, we already tried it for uh, some many body uh, systems as well, meaning that some interacting Hamiltonians. Okay. But here, but there, are, there is not that I'm you is for the later determinant. No, but, but, but you will have to exactly sol solve that many body Hamiltonian if you start with it. Like that, uh... Uh, yeah, the input is the ground state wave function, yeah, or right. the input. The input is not the ground state. The input is just the reduced density matrix of some interval. Yeah, right, right. But but for many body Hamiltonian, do you have to solve it exactly, or it's some approximate uh, density matrix? Uh... Uh... So are you asking about the numerical accuracy? Yeah, right, right, precisely. So for example, if I give you a, you know, interacting Hamiltonian, right? So. Uh, yeah, the thing is usually, um, um, yeah, I mean, I oh, so, tried so, it. Yeah, okay, so, so, so just uh, cal compute cal uh, uh, numerically, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah you, you definitely can compute it numerically. Okay. Uh, using either DMRG or quantum okay. Cardo. Okay. okay, fine. Yeah. Can, can I ask you a question too? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, so on this plot you have, uh, there's some, it looks like it's not exactly an integer always. It's kind of, you know, it's bending off at the sides. Is that just a finite size effect thing or is there something there? Uh, that's, that's actually a very good point. Uh, right, so uh, Kyle is referring to these areas. So these are near the critical point where the correlation length uh, is uh, very large. So it diverges at the critical points, right? Uh, so the requirement of this quantity to work or to give you the quantized value is that the size of this region, this A or B here, must be much larger or at least a few times the bulk correlation length. So here I chose, let's say, 20 uh, sites for this uh, subsystem. And then close to the you know, critical point, maybe the correlation length is 100 or so. So then it starts to deviate. I see. OK, thank you. All right. So um, yeah, so this, qu uh, this quantity uh, turnout can be measured, at least for qubit systems. Um, so this is a beautiful work done by uh, Zoller's group, uh, particularly Andreas Elvin, uh, where they showed that uh, one can write this quantity trace of row, row partial transpose in terms of uh, um, probability of measuring a state in a random, um, after a random unitary, um, and then accumulating all these probabilities. Um, but this is, uh, this deserves, uh, you know, uh, maybe further uh, detailed description, but let me get back to what I uh, wanted to tell you. Okay, so uh, let me now show you uh, what is going on under the hood. Uh, so remember, we, want, uh, we, we are computing this quantity, the trace of row row partial transpose. Uh, but there is actually a technical difficulty for this partial transpose when you wanna apply it to fermions. So remember what I uh, described earlier as a definition of partial transpose. It was just applying transpose to um, you know one subsystem. Okay, turns out for fermions, if you just uh, you know write the density matrix in this box space basis and apply transpose, meaning just change the indices, swap the indices, then uh, it doesn't give you um, any phase. So essentially, actually, this quantity is identically zero. It's not only that. Um, up to some, uh, you know, uh, some, um, some extra corrections. But at, the, at this uh, sweet spot that Matt described, if you compute it, you get zero. 
And uh, turns out that uh, one needs to uh, you know, uh, add this extra phase, provide this extra phase uh, here to get a consistent definition. So this phase factor at this stage, uh, just uh, you know, very, short, uh, very briefly, uh, has to do with the uh, anti-commutation relation of uh, fermions. So when you, uh, when you exchange these two um, here and there, uh, then uh, they may have opposite, uh, you know, they, they both may have odd fermion number parity. So um, then it may picks up a minus sign. But turns out actually the, 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 this phase is not just a minus, uh, minus sign. It's actually a Z4 phase. Uh, so I'm going to explain this is for more detail in the context of braiding. But uh, the, the way that we found it early on was by using the path integral formulation of Fermi zero in terms of the Grassmann variables. And sorry, there sorry. you can define, you can, you can introduce a, sorry, uh, you can introduce a cross cap in space time and then you can translate it back to what this operation is in the Fox space basis. Yes. Um, can you explain what is the inconsistency if you don't put this factor? My impression was that it was just a different definition. Yes, if, uh, yes. So there are multiple levels of inconsistencies. Uh, so one thing uh, that maybe, uh, it's, it's not about this quantity. So this quantity actually vanishes, okay? So, and uh, you know, we're hoping to get uh, some partition function uh, which has, uh, you know, which is non-vanishing in the topological limit. But another way, another immediate example that I can give you where this uh, uh, absence of the space factor gives you some inconsistencies is uh, when you compute negativity for Kitaev Majorana chain, which is a topological phase, you know, it has entanglement when you cut between two complex fermions. So if you don't include this phase factor, you get zero entanglement. There are also other, uh, you know, other inconsistencies. Uh, I mean, I, we can perhaps, uh, you know, talk about it offline if you're interested. Should I proceed? Okay. Uh, so. So. Uh, all right, so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna use this uh, diagrammatic uh, uh, representation. So remember that the density matrix is, is uh, like an operator. So it ha has two sides, uh, two, two sets of legs and the partial transpose effectively is something like this. So when I apply transpose to a subsystem, it just exchanges uh, these two legs. So for example, if you compute the Rennie entropy so this is how you contract these physical degrees of freedom. So uh, you just, uh, so this product gives you, so there is a question here. Yeah, so, um, um, okay, so I, uh, I was just uh, saying that uh, here, uh, we just contract every density matrix with the next uh, density matrix, and here we just change orders. So th this, is, this will be our guiding principle uh, for defining the partial transpose for any of. So now uh, let's uh, just consider uh, not just the Majorana chain, just an anion chain. So these anions are now just easing anions. And uh, so uh, in the, you know, again, in this uh, fixed point uh, limit, uh, we think of just uh, fusing these uh, anions or fusing these Majoranas to identity. So it can be uh, represented as this uh, um, picture. And uh, let me just remind you a few things about the Ising anion. So it has this um, quantum dimension root two and uh, then the topological spin and these F symbols. So now uh, remember that there are uh, eight of them, eight types of them. So these are just the odd indices of the 16 fold way. And we want to arrange them in a 1D chain. And uh, okay, so we already know that we should get the uh, Majorana chain, right? So the 1D system doesn't know anything about uh, this, uh, 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 the, uh, 
essentially uh, the the eightfold the eightfold um, subset of the sixteen fold way. And now let me show you uh, how this uh, trace partial uh, trace row, row partial transpose works in this case, uh, and uh, what partial transpose is. So let's begin with the density matrix. I'm just rearranging this row in terms of the bra and cut in this picture. And uh, so I'm taking the reduced density matrix. I'm tracing out here and there. And effectively, I get this, OK? And if I just follow this, again, a pictorial uh, representation here, uh, I'm going to just do this to this anion warp line, OK? Just following what I did here. And uh, so what I get essentially is a half a braid in the middle and then a topological twist here. So first of all, I can check whether this operation, you know, at the level of diagram diagrams, it preserves the trace and turns out it can be written this way in terms of this uh, braid ma uh, braiding matrices and the topological spin. And independent of new, actually this process preserves the trace. Uh, moreover, uh, when I compute this uh, trace of row row partial transpose, remember it's just uh, contracting this with this. Then I get this. So it's uh, more or less like these two, two, two twists, right? This one is opposite to that one, but uh, we know that we cannot just rotate diagrams in this anion picture. Um, so it is related to this uh, Frobenius Shore indicator. Uh, nevertheless, we can go ahead do the calculations and this is how it looks like the trace of row row partial transpose and uh, as we see here it gives you it gives us the again the eighth root of unity this new equals one um topological invariant but you see that there's a difference so it seems like one of them corresponds to um uh, the new equals one in the Z8 classification of 1D chain, and the other one corresponds to minus one, which is just a reflection symmetry, uh, reflection symmetric partner of the, the other one. Uh, and here I'm just showing you a way to change the, the boundary condition, the spin structure uh, on the RP2. Uh, so anyway, uh, this turns out to be working and one can also compute negativity. So negativity is just contracting rho T with itself. And as a result, uh, so this quantity is actually uh, doesn't have a, any sign and uh, it gives us the quantum dimension. So th this is uh, this, uh, this second thing. But now let's go ahead and uh, think about this uh, in more general context. So let's uh, consider the Zn parafermions. So the algebra or the fusion algebra of the Zn parafermions uh, is given by this. So the sigmas are the parafermion. Um, uh, anions and then uh, these A and B are uh, just uh, uh, the Laughlin quasi particles. So the, this is, uh, you can think of these A and B and sigma as uh, when we introduce superconductivity into the fractional quantum hall or the Laughlin state. Um, so on, the, on this side, I'm showing you again an anion chain. Uh, so here it's a parafermion chain and it obeys this. Um, uh, parafermionic algebra or statistics. And we can construct a local Hilbert space uh, and a many body Hilbert space just by fusing the two, uh, uh, two parafermions. It's, uh, th so this process is very much like the, um, the Majorana fermion. The only difference here is uh, we have n states when we fuse the two uh, parafermions. So you can think of this occupation number basis that I wrote as a clock uh, clock variable basis for parafermions. Uh, okay, so let me speed up and tell you quickly uh, what is uh, going to happen. So I started from this uh, anion picture and I, def I introduced this uh, like a 1D chain by coupling uh, these parafermions. And uh, turns out this uh, definition of braiding can be translated into again this phase. Okay, so this is now a basis vector of the uh, reduced density matrix for parafermions in this occupation number basis. And then uh, again, the partial transpose is just exchanging the first uh, bra the, the, uh, the first uh, subsystem, the indices within the first subsystem. And uh, we need to provide this extra phase. And the phase factor, okay, I forgot to say it, it 
it only depends on the total uh, occupation number within each subsystem. Uh, okay, so let me show you briefly uh, how, uh, some basic numerics in this uh, system. So now I'm considering uh, not just a fixed point Hamiltonian, a uh, Hamiltonian uh, which has both the uh, the uh, the, uh, the tunneling between the parafermion nearest neighbors uh, within a cell and the nearest neighbors uh, uh, between the uh, sorry the two um, nearest uh, parafermions of two consecutive uh, uh, unit cells. And uh, here is the some numerics. So this delta is just the difference between these two J and F. Uh, so at delta equals zero, it's a critical point, and we have these two phases. And I don't know if you see these, uh, um, these uh, because we cannot see it very, good, uh, very well on our screen. Uh, but the, uh, as you see, in deep in the topological limit, uh, the negativity admits these uh, quantized values, which is uh, nothing but the log of the quantum dimension of the uh, parafermion. So one can go ahead and uh, do this at the critical point. For example, look at the, um, the critical, uh, the, the scaling behavior of the entanglement negativity, which is given by this, and compute the central charge. So as you see here for the Z2 parafermions, uh, it nicely reproduces the C equals one half. And then for example, for the Z3 parafermion, it gives a, very, a number very close to uh, four fifths. So let me wrap up. Uh, um, so in summary, I showed you uh, a general framework to define partial, uh, partial transpose, at least the one which is applicable to not just qubits uh, and fermions, but also anions. And uh, there are uh, several avenues uh, to pursue for future. Uh, thanks. I have a quick question. Can you go back to the parafermion slide? Uh, let me just quickly, I don't know what happened. Uh, sorry, which slide? Uh, the parafermion slide. Uh, the this one or the previous one? Yeah, this one. Uh, can okay. You Say again, what is that little p in the braiding matrix? Uh, oh, p is just an integer. Um, so there are p of them. So this p is, uh, again, a topological invariant. Right, I, I uh, so for the Zn parafermions, it's just an odd integer. And the great common div uh, divisor of that, the p and n is 1. I know what mathematically that corresponds to. That's a choice oh, okay. of my characters for the ZN. But a physical yeah. example on the spin chain, what does it correspond to? Oh, I think in here uh, it's just, uh, you know, partial transpose is basis dependent, okay? okay. And uh, this just corresponds to different bases for us. Okay. So essentially, you can apply a local unitary to go from one p to another if there is more than one p but i thought so it doesn't change it doesn't change negativity for example like all these uh, quantities that i described after taking trace will not depend on p but i thought choosing different p's corresponds to different categories of anions but you are saying that right it's just a and that is a two, two plus one D uh, phenomenon. Right. So it does not, uh, it does not uh, make any difference in, uh, in one D. Uh, like this Frobenius sure indicator. This is a one plus one D spin chain, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, so if the partial transpose is uh, basis dependent, 
do you know like what combinations lets you get like basis independent things for example it looks like trace of row row transpose row partial transpose um gives you like physical information right so negativity certainly actually is uh like manifestly basis independent okay because it has to do with the spectrum of the partial transpose um but um uh, what happens for it? So for the trace of row, row partial transpose, you, you should think of it as uh, uh, So the partial transpose itself is actually technically partial time reversal. When you change your basis, your time reversal, uh, the, the unitary part of the time reversal operator also changes. If you take that into account and uh, you know put it into this uh, trace of row u row partial transpose u dagger then there will be a cancellation so in that regard uh this row row partial transpose or row u row part this quantity let me show you this quantity is also basis independent this one <coughs> this one i see yeah thanks so you should think of this as uh, uh, partial time reversal transformation. So this U is the unitary part of the time reversal, which changes on their basis transformation. I see, thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right, so if there is no further question, uh, thanks everyone for staying tuned and uh, uh, we look forward to future talks. Actually, we are looking for future speakers. Uh, so please feel free to email me if you are interested in giving a talk. And hopefully we'll have our next session in two weeks. I think I'm going to stay online. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Can I ask some common questions? Hello? Yeah. Did you want to ask of uh, Hassan? Yes. Hello? Hassan, there's a question, I think. I don't think he can hear me. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Okay, it's okay. I can uh, describe it to you. Yeah, uh, or any time, up to you. We can talk here, or we can talk um, on the stack exchange. Oh, not a stack exchange, what am I saying? Slack. Hassan, can you hear the audio? I think maybe he can't hear us for some reason. Yes, no, no, yes, I can, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, so I feel a little bit confused about the setup. Sure. Let me let me uh, share my screen. Do, do you need my screen? Do you need to see the slides? That, that will help. Yes. That will help. Oh, okay. The, the thing I'm confused by is you start with some one plus one D spin cam, right? Just, just but then why is? But then the you show some great so the, unfortunately the room is crowded a little bit here just a second uh, okay, actually, uh, 
Okay, it's not too bad. Yeah. I may sign out if that's okay. What did you say? I said I may sign out if that's okay with you. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, the, yeah, the meeting is uh, over. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Uh, hopefully it will be bi-weekly, yeah. So my question is, you start with yes. one plus one D spin chain. But yes. why is the braiding relevant at the end of the day? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I can understand it at least in time reversal symmetric Sorry, I cannot hear you well. Sorry? Now it's better. I couldn't hear you before. Oh, so I'm just saying uh, when you have time reversal symmetry, yes, uh, then um, you know you can twist uh, the space time boundary condition by time reversal, which is just a reflection. Uh, so essentially, you get non orientable manifolds. Okay, You're doing one plus one D, right? Yes, okay, yes. No, I mean, at any dimensions, I think time reversal. If you yes. twist it, it does give you non-oriental manifold. But uh, right now, uh, um, yeah, so then, uh, you know, we were thinking of uh, um, uh, like how to implement this time reversal transformation in the, uh, in the operator formalism, okay? Yes. Yes. So the closest thing that we found for density matrices is this partial transpose. I mean, essentially, time reversal is complex conjugation. When it acts on a Hermitian operator, it gives you transposition. And if you want to apply partial transpose, partial, or sorry, if you want to apply um, time reversal symmetry partially, okay? Then uh, we may think of a partial transpose. Symmetry as a global symmetry. I don't know what that, what do you mean by applying it. Um, That's a good point. Uh, yeah, we have actually a couple of papers on this paper. Um, you know, uh, it can be characterized in terms of uh, some projective representation of the uh the edge modes okay yes. the project so the, the edge modes transform projectively under this the global symmetry okay yes, yes. so you know what Xiu Hang? yeah i i don't i'm not sure if you can hear me uh you break up a little bit but now i can hear you I was going to suggest that maybe just the two of us can chat uh, offline. Yeah, sounds good. All right, then. Um, um, okay, so uh, I'm going to turn off the, uh, uh, the Zoom meeting. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for attending. Thank you for See you all next time. See you.